right now. New this noon, a Bear County judge ruling that an executive order blocking jail releases is unconstitutional. The measure brought into question during one woman's case, Janie Vieta. Vieta was sentenced to a year in prison on a misdemeanor assault charge. Due to good behavior, she should have been released early, but the governor's order blocked her release. Judge Ron Runhell set her bond at $1 so she could get out of jail, and now he's ruled the executive order is unconstitutional. Governor Abbott issued the order back in March of 2020 at the height of the pandemic. It was meant to curb jail releases. After the Supreme Court in Texas yesterday squashed Bear County and San Antonio's fight to reinstate mask mandates, local officials are pushing on in another courtroom. Again today, that ruling could be reversed as an injunction hearing is currently taking place. Eric Hernandez has been listening in on this hearing today, and she's now joining us live here in the studio, Erica. Hey guys, well, this, this injunction hearing didn't begin until a little after 10 this morning and is still going on right now as the city, county, and the attorney's general's office are presenting witnesses as part of their arguments. This injunction hearing is being held again in the 57th district court and being presided by Judge Antonio Artiaga. Last week, Judge Artiaga ruled in favor of the city's request for temporary restraining order to issue mass mandates. The first witness for the city was Metro Health Medical Director Dr. Jenda Wu, who talked about what the current situation in Bear County is like right now and how there has been a huge increase in cases. Dr. Wu also talked about the strain on hospitals as they are short staffed and nurses are being stretched thin. She made a comment about how she was worried we were going to break our health care system because of the current strain. Other witnesses expected are the Bear County Fire Marshal, both city and county managers, a local parent, and a woman whose husband died of COVID-19. Judge Artiaga, at the end of this hearing, could rule to reinstate to allow the city and county to again issue a mass mandate or deny that request. Now, we'll have more on this hearing and possible ruling later today at 5. You can follow KSAT.com for all the latest. David, Ursula. Thank you so much, Erica. Nationwide, more than 140,000 new COVID cases reported over the weekend, and the highest concentration is in southern states. Texas now treating more hospitalized patients than the peak of last year's summer outbreak. Doctors continuing to ask people to get the COVID vaccine, especially to protect those who can't get the shot, the children. The more of these adults that we get immunized, the, the fewer infections that we're going to see in children and the fewer of these complications that we're going to see. Again, the debate over masks continues. Several school districts in Florida and Texas have mandated masks, defying orders from their governors. And parents are following the mask debate pretty closely as children head back to class. 17 districts in our viewing area are starting school today. One of those districts was Northeast ISD, and Sarah Costa spoke with parents at Cerna Elementary as they dropped off their kids for the first day and how they felt about the mask mandate debacle. It's real scary. It's, it's scary, scary. Emily Cruz has a kindergartner and first grader starting in person today at NEISD's Cerna Elementary School. She says she wishes that the mask mandate was still in place because it gave her a peace of mind while her children attended school last year. I'm kind of iffy about it because I know it's going to be more students because I know this year is no virtual at all. So, you know, it's kind of scary. Destiny Pearson kept her daughter Emily at home for her entire first year of elementary school. So today, Emily is stepping into Cerna Elementary School for the first time to start first grade. And mom Destiny is nervous about masks not being mandatory. It's a little bit overwhelming, a little bit. Um, I think that we're ready for her to go back, but it's just like, is she going to keep her mask on? Is she going to do the things that she needs to do? It's why Destiny has been working with her daughter for a full year, having her practice wearing her mask for a long period of time. And we even put a back, uh, an extra one in her backpack. So she has a backup back here, and then she has the one on her face. NEISD superintendent putting out a message yesterday saying they are strongly encouraging all students and staff to wear masks on district campuses. Principal of Cerna Elementary Jennifer Lomas says she believes students at the school are safe with the majority of them choosing to wear a mask. 
We're absolutely going to encourage mask wearing. We're going to model it, but we just at the end of the day want the stronger message to be. We're excited you're here. We want you to have a good first day. And just an example in a classroom, we're in a second grade classroom of 16 students. All of them are wearing masks. I'm Sarah Acosta, KSAT 12 News. Meantime, Seguin ISD also opening its doors for students this morning, and parents are probably wondering what school's going to look like today in response to the growing number of coronavirus cases. The district says thermal temperature scanners will be inserted at all campus main entrances, and coronavirus testing is available as well. There will not be a vaccine mandate at Seguin ISD campuses, and while students and staff are encouraged to wear their masks as well, it will not be a requirement. The district asking parents to make the decision whether to send their children to school with a mask. It's also important to note that virtual learning and social distancing measures will not be in place this year. Social distancing is not going to exist. It is going to look like it did in the 2019-2020 school year before COVID hit us. So there will not be social distancing. So that's another consideration for parents to factor in when they're making a decision as to whether or not they are going to vaccinate their students who are 12 or older or send them to school with a mask on. Dr. Gutierrez went on to say that those who test positive for coronavirus will have to be quarantined. The district will notify parents and families immediately if there's a positive COVID case. Parents at Southside ISD will notice a new safety measure across all campuses this school year. Guard checks have been installed to control access to schools and Southside ISD police officers will be the ones checking in those that enter. Lacey Barrera spoke to the school district's chief of police on the importance of the measure and what parents and guardians should keep in mind. Who is trying to enter the schools and for what purpose? They will ask for some form of identification and their first role will be they will run uh, the person's identification through a, a software system. The guard shacks are now the first line of defense across all Southside ISD campuses. That system identifies potential sex offenders. If it's a yes, then there's certain alerts that go out to the police department. Safety and security are the primary concerns, but the guard shacks could also help with logistics in case of an incident. We want to know who's on campus um, in case we have to evacuate. We need to know, get a, a head count, a identification of everybody. However, check-ins will not be required for student drop-offs. If you're dropping off in the mornings, it's a little bit more lax because we have so many people. It's impossible for us to stop every parent. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Another change that parents are going to notice is that morning and after school traffic will be a bit more organized with the help of school district security and police officers. That's because Southside ISD PD now has 24 hour coverage. These measures are also going to help bolster safety for students, staff and the community. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Pretty day just like yesterday. Lots of storybook clouds as I call them. Very story, but got there for right now. We are going to watch for the potential of some scattered showers, maybe isolated showers and storms developing this afternoon. Some more downpours. We got some really good rain yesterday across parts of San Antonio. That potential is there again today, although rain chances may be just a little bit lower. Let's look at the radar and satellite and you can see where the rain is now. Right along the coast, nothing much here around San Antonio. We do notice some cloud cover trying to build, though, to our south and east. If we're going to see any developing downpours, that's probably where they would start. They're somewhere between Gonzales, Beeville, and Victoria. We'll keep an eye on the radar. Things, again, are quiet for right now. Here's what to expect. Afternoon downpours today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. By Thursday and Friday, Friday it turns drier, more hot and humid. And for the weekend, we're going to keep the forecast dry for now, but we'll be watching what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico and in the tropics, and we're going to have more on that coming up here in just a bit. Here's what the forecast looks like today. 30% chance of rain. Temperatures topping out close to 94 with northwesterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Again, we'll have an update on the tropics and a look at that seven day forecast here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. New at noon, the Ford Holiday River will be taking place this year. The parade that is you're going to see it in November and it's already time to grab your tickets. Organizers announcing this morning that tickets went on sale today for the 40th annual parade. The parade takes place November 26th. This year's Grand Marshal will add a little more magic to the event. 
It's going to be Willy Wonka. You can get your tickets on SanAntonioRiverWalk.com. A new $10 million facility will soon appear on the Texas State campus. Officials broke ground today, and they hope the facility will be done by the fall of next year. The more than 10,000 square foot building will serve approximately 600 students and faculty of the College of Fine Arts and Communication. It will feature a film soundstage, TV studio, recording mix classroom, editing lab, and some offices. The school says the new project comes as more students show interest in studying film. So our students need to be able to work on the same equipment, same circumstances as they're going to encounter in the field. So when they go to a job, employers know that our students know what they're doing. The building will also include a television studio. Students will be producing a campus-oriented newscast as well as sports and interview programs. Speaking of sports, the Spurs back in action last night in Vegas. One player starting to really shine during the summer. Got that for you. Coming up. A fire on San Antonio's east side destroyed two businesses. Why neighbors say uh, their community will feel the loss. People in an east side neighborhood have lost two businesses, which they say meant a lot to them. An overnight fire destroyed a convenience store and a fast food restaurant at the corner of East Commerce and Walters. As Katrina Weber tells us, it's also created a dangerous challenge for fire crews who had to fight those fires. A thick cloud of smoke nearly blacks out the source of trouble at this east side corner. But it was the building itself at East Commerce and Walters that had fire crews practically fighting blindly. The fire was deep seated inside. That building was sealed up very tight. Thick metal gates on the windows and doors made it tough to see inside the two businesses in the space. Firefighters got called here around 2 a.m. But it took nearly half an hour and lots of heavy equipment for them to get inside, opening the gates like a tuna can. This one was probably more like a bank vault. Large circular saws and pry bars and a lot of a lot of muscle. Eventually they knocked down the flames, but not before the fire had done irreparable damage. Arena Food Mart and Anthony's Chicken both were destroyed. The losses aren't only limited to the owners of these businesses. This also was a big blow to people in this community. It's sad to see something, you know, that we come to enjoy be gone just like that overnight. Juan Rodriguez and his family counted on both businesses, only a short walk from their home. I always helped out everybody from the neighborhood. I don't think there's no one who can say anything bad about that person from the, either one. The man from the store was very nice too. While he has to find a new place to shop, he feels for the owners and wonders what they'll do. The fire investigators, the work here is done. They say this fire was accidental probably caused by electrical problems. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Did you get any rain at your house yesterday? Not a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. It rained for like an hour and a half in the city. It We're going to get that again today? It's possible. I don't think we'll see quite the uh, the amount of rain that we saw yesterday, but there still will be some chances there today for some downpours. Yesterday was very good to us. We got some good rain even at the airport. The aquifer, however, is down a tenth of a foot, 664.6. Still in good shape, though. In the pollen count, because the rain molds jumped up there at 4,810, pigweed is low. We've got some stuff brewing in the tropics. We're going to give you the latest updates coming up. Like five, six days, seven days without rain, and then bam, yesterday and picked the it up again. Thunder and the lightning. Yeah. It was the real deal. Stuff. It was intense. If you were taking a nap, it, it <laughs> woke you up. It was loud. We, we did get some good rain in spots, uh, some big time rain just north of downtown. Uh, the airport picked up a little bit, and if you're up around Bolverde, you got quite a bit of rain 1.18 inches. Parts of Bandera County over two inches, and that's the nature of this activity, right? Uh, pop up, good rain in spots. Not everybody's going to get it, but there is the opportunity for more of it today, and we could see some numbers like this, close to an inch of rain. If you're lucky enough to get underneath one of these downpours, not seeing anything right now. There's no vertical growth on any of these clouds yet, but we think there will be some as we get into the afternoon. Just partly cloudy skies this hour. 88 at the airport, south southwesterly winds at 7. And look at that feels like number 96 thanks to a dew point 
of 73, so it's extremely sticky out there. Uh, temperatures 87 in New Braunfels, 85 Seguin. We're close to 90 at Stinson, and we are at 90 down there in Pleasanton. 89 in Kerrville, 90 in Del Rio. Some clouds trying to bubble up there across the hill country, too. So there could be some showers beginning to develop just to the east of Rock Springs. We'll watch some of this uh, cumulus development, too. See if we can get some rain on the radar, but nothing at the moment. Those feels like temperatures close to 100 in Pleasanton, 92 Uvalde, 96 in Kerrville. So, yes, it is hot out there for sure, and the heat index will creep up close to 100 probably as we get into the afternoon. Uh, the radar does show a few showers along the coast, and that's probably with the sea breeze. As that works inland, there will be additional development, probably Beeville to Victoria with that. So we keep an eye on that area as well. The forecast does bring a few showers and storms into play around 2 o'clock. And then as we get into the afternoon, isolated showers and storms popping up. Probably not as much as yesterday. But uh, there will be some nonetheless, and we may even see some of that activity last into the night out west, west of Del Rio, but most everything else will die down with the loss of daytime heating. Temperatures today up around 94, about a 30% chance of rain from about 2 o'clock through, say, 6 o'clock, uh, the evening hours. And here's the current setup. We've got sort of an unsettled pattern over Texas. Rich of high pressures way out west. Just a little disturbance is rolling through, and that's what's giving us, giving us our rain chances. We're also watching Fred, which right now is bringing some very heavy rain to parts of the Florida Panhandle, and uh, it is moving closer to shore. Looks like it could be making landfall here pretty soon. It's I mean, it's right on the coast there, and there are tropical storm warnings in effect along the Panhandle of Florida. Winds at 60 miles per hour gusting to 70. This thing's going to move north, bring heavy rain as it uh, moves north into parts of Tennessee and Kentucky. Meantime, we are also keeping tabs on Grace, Tropical Depression Grace. Winds are at 35 miles per hour. This is moving west at 15 miles per hour and bringing heavy rain to parts of Haiti, a country that does not need any more devastation, but there is going to be some heavy rain there. This is expected to move into the Gulf by Thursday and then by the weekend move into Mexico. Most of the computer models are keeping this well south of Texas. Now that's sort of a change from maybe what we were looking at yesterday that would keep a lot of the effects out of South Texas. So we're going to take rain out of the forecast this weekend. It could throw a few showers in our direction, but uh, as of right now, dry Saturday and Sunday. 30% chance of rain, though, over the next couple of days. We'll continue to see some of those afternoon downpours until uh, probably Thursday or Friday when things begin to dry out. Guys. Thanks, Justin. A local boxer put on one of the best performances of his career. We have those details coming up. And San Antonio FC hit with COVID coming up. Spurs back in action last night in Las Vegas for game four of the summer league playoff against the Brooklyn Nets. The Spurs started off strong first as Joe Wieskamp knocking down the three. That's a 14 4 lead for the Spurs. Then Trey Jones comes up with the steal and heads the other way. That's going to be good for two of his 18. The Spurs got up to a 22 8 lead. They led 30 20 after one, 53 48 at halftime. Fast forward to the fourth quarter. Spurs down three. First round draft pick Joshua Primo nails the three. It's tied at 91. He finished with a team high 21, but it wasn't enough. Cameron Thomas went off for Brooklyn, scoring a game high 36. Spurs fall 104-100. They will play the Thunder coming up later today. Our sports team has the best boxing coverage in town, and it was a huge night for Joshua Franco over the weekend. He was putting on a show on ESPN, and it's no doubt people now know who El Professor is all about. Just taught class the other night. Pretty much put box his best 12 rounds he has ever fought with his WBA championship belt on the line. Flat out dominated Andrew Maloney throughout the night. Franco waited for his moments to strike. It happened often. He also never let Maloney get into any kind of boxing rhythm. Franco outpunched Maloney 168 to 107. He wins by unanimous decision and is still the WBA World Super Flyweight Champion. So what was the key to his success Saturday night? I would say using my jab, using my skills, my footwork. You know, I had to switch it up on him. He thought I was going to put pressure on him the whole time. Uh, I, I, I saw that wasn't working, so I had to switch it up and go to my boxing skills. You know, you started to get into a groove in the second half of the fight. And it's rare to hear a trainer tell his fighter in continual rounds, go out there and have fun. What did that mean to you when Robert was telling you that? 
I would just go out there and, and be myself, do my thing like I do in sparring. You know, I have fun, you know, with my rhythm, with my jab, with my feet. You know, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in there, and that's what I did. Franco also said he wants to unify the flyweight division and that he has respect for Maloney and wishes him the best in his future. Congratulations to El Professor on his second trilogy victory. You can read more about the fight on Instant Replay page on KSET.com. And COVID-19 has struck San Antonio FC for the first time this season due to multiple positive tests within the organization. The team's match against the New York Red Bulls, too, was postponed. No makeup date has been announced as of yet. In the meantime, local product Ethan Bryant is getting an opportunity to play elsewhere. San Antonio loaned Bryant to the Richmond Kickers of the USL League for the remainder of the season. The move was announced on Thursday. Bryant says that's going to be great for him. He wants to help his new team any way he can. He says he's ready to show what he can do. So here's a look at the SAFC schedule. If they can uh, get this COVID problem under control, Real Monarchs SLC, Saturday, 7.30 at Toyota Field. Hopefully it happens. Yeah. Hope everybody's okay. Yeah. New today at five, no matter your favorite salad dressing, it can turn your healthy salad bowl into something eh, less healthy. Today at five, we're going to take a look at some dress dressings that are not only good, but they're good for you as well. In Afghanistan, thousands of people are rushing to Kabul's airport in an effort to flee the country. Meanwhile, the Biden administration defending its withdrawal of troops there as the country falls right into the hands of the Taliban. ABC's Ike Ajachi has the latest. This morning, an emergency session has been called at the UN, just as the city of Kabul falls into the hands of the Taliban. The Al Jazeera news network airing this scene, claiming to show heavily armed Taliban fighters entering Kabul's abandoned presidential palace, declaring it the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Now, the effort to escape. ABC's Ian Panel on the ground in Kabul, painting a picture of the frantic efforts to lead the country. This crowd rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. The airport now overrun. Desperate, chaotic scenes as massive crowds surge onto the tarmac, desperate to get out of the country. The scenes adding to the growing pressure from President Biden's original confidence in the Afghan troops. But the likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. This morning, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was asked if President Biden was wrong about the Taliban and the Afghan army's capabilities. When push came to shove, they decided not to step up and fight for their country. And so the question facing the president is, should U.S. men and women be put into the middle of another country's civil war when their own army won't fight to defend them. Over the weekend, members of the House and Senate were briefed of the situation by the Biden administration. It's, it's an uh, unmitigated disaster of epic proportions. And I think the president, uh, this is going to be a stain on this president and his presidency. President Biden will address the nation later this afternoon about the current situation in Afghanistan. Ike Ajachi, ABC News, Washington. And we're going to be carrying the president's remarks live right here on KSAT 12. It is this afternoon. We're expecting that press conference to be around 245. The military could be relocating tens of thousands of Afghans looking to live here in the U.S. and some may come to Texas. According to the Pentagon, the Department of Defense may relocate up to 30,000 of them to Fort Bliss here in Texas and Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. The Afghans applied for special immigrant visas. Many of them worked with the U.S. during the war and say they will likely be targeted now that the Taliban has taken control of the country. The Defense and State Departments confirm they will accelerate the applicants' ev evacuation. Meanwhile, the Department and Homeland Security said it's working to push visas through the system and get applicants clearly through security. The Biden administration has approved a significant and permanent increase in the levels of food stamp assistance available to families in need. This is the largest single increase in the program's history. Starting in October, average benefits for food stamps, officially known as the SNAP program, will rise more than 25 percent above pre-pandemic levels. The increased assistance will be available indefinitely to all 42 million SNAP beneficiaries. 
The nation's largest wildfire continues to burn a month after it started. 6,000 firefighters are battling the Dixie Fire in Northern California. It has scorched nearly 867 square miles and firefighters across western states worry more fires will spark because of unstable weather. Thunderstorms haven't produced much rain. Instead, they're whipping up high winds and dry lightning strikes across the northern Sierra. Adding to the fears, communities out west are still dealing with drought. More than 100 large wildfires are burning in more than a dozen states across the West. Haiti is still recovering once again after getting hit by a devastating 7.2 earthquake over the weekend. And right now, nearly 1,300 people are confirmed dead. At least 2,800 people are hurt and hundreds are still missing. ABC's Matt Gutman in Haiti has a look at the destruction left behind. This was the rectory of one of the main churches here. Yesterday, they pulled three bodies out of the rubble here. It is believed one of them was the local priest. Now, there are still hundreds more missing here in Haiti, and it's believed that many hundreds more have been buried in unmarked graves, possibly never to be counted. This, as the race to rescue intensifies. On Sunday, a mother and a child pulled from the rubble after the building they were in collapsed. The United States Agency for International Aid and the Coast Guard already on the ground and preparing to join them is Fairfax County, Virginia's fire rescue team, flying in 59 rescuers and four search dogs. We bring 52,000 pounds of equipment. That's enough for us to set up our base camp so that we can break through collapsed buildings as well as search equipment. One of the primary challenges for those rescue teams coming in is going to be the state of the roads here. Now, some of them are impassable. There's tangles of debris there. Some of them are also prowled by these local, very powerful gangs. On top of that, there is this tropical depression bearing down on the region. We're expecting to feel its impact later today. Matt Gutman, ABC News, Lakaya, Haiti. And those guys are also dealing with tropical weather as well, and not the good kind. Yeah, as Matt just said, Grace will be coming through there and dropping heavy rains, adding insult to injury. Boy, my heart goes out to those folks in Haiti. It's just been a rough go of it, and there's going to be a lot of cleanup ahead. Hopefully, Grace remains weak and just brings some rain and moves along so it doesn't cause too many problems there. We're going to be watching Grace for our forecast, although it looks like it's going to stay south of Texas at this point. Well, let's look at the uh, temperatures around the area. 88 degrees at the airport, 88 at Randolph, 88 Comfort, closing in on 90 in Kerrville. Quite a bit of sun just west of San Antonio, but we're starting to see some clouds fill in here, and these are the kind of clouds that may bubble up into some showers and storms a little bit later today. Uh, looking at the uh, radar, we do notice some activity right along the coast with the sea breeze. That'll work inland over the next couple of hours. That will create some showers and storms, Beeville to Victoria. And the rain chances today, about 30%, so it'll be isolated. That'll be the case tomorrow and Wednesday, and then they taper off a little bit. We're still going to keep some very small chances in over the weekend in case Grace throws a little bit of moisture in our direction. But as I said, looks like it stays well south of our area. 94 degrees today, the high temperature. It'll feel like it's in the upper 90s thanks to the heat index and a northwesterly wind anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour. Look for rain chances to die down tonight with the loss of daytime heating. Guys. Thank you, Justin. More and more energy customers are jumping on the solar power bandwagon. Still ahead, how it may be easier than ever before to get solar power. New movies dominating the box office, which debuted in the top spot. Coming up in the spotlight. And if you're in the market for a new phone and Apple is your brand of choice, you might want to wait before making a purchase. We'll explain why coming up after the break. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Boeing facing another setback in their Starliner launch. The aerospace company Starliner Space Capsule being sent back to the factory. That to fix faulty valves that has delayed the past several launch attempts so far. The company says they're working with NASA to determine a new launch date when the spacecraft is ready. But if that doesn't happen soon, the Starliner could lose its spot in an incoming SpaceX Dragon cargo ship that is scheduled to launch at the end of the month. Meanwhile, Elon Musk announced over the weekend that SpaceX's Starship rocket could be ready for its first 
first flight into space in the next few weeks. The Tesla CEO and SpaceX founder saying in a tweet that the only thing the rocket is waiting for is regulatory approval. SpaceX successfully landing its prototype of the Starship back in May, the first successful landing following four that ended up exploding. And some of the country's largest retail companies set to report their earnings all this week. It all kicks off Tuesday with Walmart and Home Depot. Then Wednesday, investors are expecting earnings from Target and Lowe's. Thursday comes Kohl's and Macy's. And then Foot Locker set to close out the week on Friday. And that's your Cheddar News, business and tech update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. Other consumer news, Apple fans may want to hold off on buying that new iPhone. Apple should be announcing new models sometime next month. So what updates might you see in the company's newest smartphones? Analysts tell the Wall Street Journal that we'll see incremental changes, including a camera that's improved, still 5G, but not yet fully foldable. Uh-oh, no flip phone? Like two models recently announced by Samsung. Oh, well, they got them. Solar panel installations are booming, and now there's a new online tool that makes the process of getting solar power faster, more efficient, and easier than before. CNN's Jeremy Roth takes a look at the new app. Solar power is heating up in America. More businesses and homeowners than ever before are investing in solar panel systems. Almost half of new electrical capacity in 2020 came from solar, and the Solar Energy Industries Association says the U.S. is expected to deploy three times as much solar capacity over the next decade as was installed by the end of the last. Homeowners like Mitch Kappa of Atlanta are leading the charge as early adopters. For sure, like checking you know, my power bill now versus before, the solar panels were activated, you can see a, a clear difference. Honestly, the biggest motivation is probably just more of a, an environmental aspect, just to do something to put, like, you know, my little drop in the bucket as far as what we can do. An obvious challenge for homeowners is the upfront system costs, but the real hurdle has been clearing the red tape. Since every state and local jurisdiction has its own requirements, investing in solar has included lots of paperwork and lots of waiting. Until now, the U.S. Department of Energy has debuted an online tool called Solar App. It's designed to streamline applications, standardize requirements, and in some cases provide instant permit approvals for installations. It's a key part in aiding the Biden administration's long-term climate change goals. The costs of delay are simply too high and the economics tell us that there's simply no reason to wait because solar power just makes sense. I'm Jeremy Roth reporting. One thing about it, if you got solar panels, you don't have to worry about heating them up in South Texas, do you? No, they do pretty well this time of year, <laughs> I'd say. Uh, making a lot of energy, although this summer has been cloudier and rainier than most, and we got some yesterday. Boy, did you see some of the video coming out of the Capitol yesterday? They got a ton of rain in Austin. We saw a little bit here. 88 so far today, 71 the low this morning. Records are 103 and 63, set back in 1969 and 2004. Another look at the radar coming up. And we'll talk about average high temperatures that are on their way down. Coming up. He was just talking about the Capitol yesterday. You see the pictures of the, the Capitol flooding yesterday? That's, that's a lot. A, of, yeah, it's a lot of rain lot. real fast. Four and a half inches they got in Austin and wow. came very quickly. And that's what resulted in some of the flooding there. There was some minor flooding around San Antonio, but nothing like what they were looking at in Austin. Some more chances today. A little bit of good news, too, in the climatology department. Today is sort of our peak high temperature. We average 97 on this date, but after today, that average temperature starts to go down. Does that mean it's going to cool down in the next couple of weeks? No, but it shows you that we can start to get fronts, early fronts this time of year, and eventually that starts to drag the average high temperature down a little bit. Notice it lags our summer solstice lags behind that. Our hottest time of the year is this this week in August and then things start to come down after that. Hopefully we will start to get some fronts next couple of months and that will help to generate some rain and hopefully some cooler temperatures. Not the case today. We've got partly cloudy skies and temperatures at this hour closing in on 90 degrees. We are at 90 at Randolph with calm winds reported there. 88 Comfort, 89 Kerrville, 87 Rio Medina, 92 down there in Divine and 91 in Pleasanton. Plenty of 90s as you go south and west of town. 85 up in Austin, 87 right now in LaGrange. 
and heat index values are really starting to climb close to 100 in Katula 97 is what it feels like in Kennedy and 95 in Gonzales you can expect heat index values to be up close to 100 again today satellite and radar show that uh, we do have some clouds bubbling up and remember I said we'll watch this area right here east of Rock Springs there you go some showers developing right as we speak there in Kerr County just west of Kerrville and then we're also seeing some activity along the sea breeze and that's starting to lift north. You'll see some of these clouds maybe bubble up into a few showers and storms as well. It'll be very localized but there could be some spots that get some decent rain out of all of this and the computer models hinting at this uh, isolated activity through the afternoon. So two o'clock you may see a little bit more on the radar. Four or five o'clock, still some activity out there. I don't think it'll be as widespread as it was yesterday, but evening commute, there is the potential for a quick downpour. And then by tonight, things will calm down with the loss of daytime heating, with the exception being up across the Edwards Plateau, where there could be some lingering showers and storms. Our high temperature today, up around 94, 30% chance of rain through the afternoon and evening hours. Well, let's check in on Fred again, and this is very close to making landfall. You can see the center of circulation is right there, kind of a lopsided storm, and this is bringing a lot of heavy rain to Panama City. That's where the strongest winds are likely now. Winds at 65 miles per hour, so this is a high-end tropical storm gusting to 70 and it's moving north northeast at about nine miles per hour. This is going to be a rainmaker as it moves north up through the Atlanta area and into parts of Kentucky and West Virginia over the next couple of days. Meantime, we have Grace, which is uh, just to the south of Haiti now. And we mentioned that, uh, yes, it is bringing some heavy rain to Haiti. Unfortunately, winds are at 35 miles per hour, gusting to 45, and this will continue to move west towards Jamaica. That's where there are tropical storm and hurricane watches out for this particular system, or I should say tropical storm watches. Uh, this storm is expected to stay somewhat weak because it'll be moving over or interacting with some land. By the time we get into Thursday, it does start to move into the Gulf of Mexico, but all indications at this point keep it well south of Texas, and the computer models really agree with that. There isn't a model that takes it north into the state of Texas, so that we keep all the activity well to our south. Could throw a few clouds in our direction, but we're not expecting really any significant impacts at all. And I should mention, there's another tropical depression out there near Bermuda. That one could also get named. It would be Henri, Henri if it does. Otherwise, afternoon downpours for us. 30% chance rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Another slight chance Thursday. And dry and hot, partly cloudy over the weekend, guys. Once again, different sort of summer. That's right. Love it. Yep. Three big new movie hit theaters this weekend and really shook up the box office charts. Look at the top five films coming up. The author, producer, and star of Big Little Lies all the way back together for another miniseries. And that was really good, so I'm looking forward to this. The Ensemble Show debuts this week on Hulu. CNN's David Daniel has a look at Nine Perfect Strangers. Welcome to Tranquillum House. The people who come here, they come to heal. I don't want to suffer. You're already suffering. Nine perfect strangers put themselves in the hands of Nicole Kidman's Masha, each hoping for some kind of healing. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Likewise. So uh, what brings you here? Because I have to say you look pretty perfect. <laughs> Why would you say something like that? You know, these characters are all so individual. They're all broken and they're all interesting. My vote is give this thing a shot. Open up a new door. Some doors are meant to stay closed. I have a dark sense of humor, so I always think when people are at the end of their ropes, that's when they do the funniest things. So, what's your story? I have one. Everybody has a story. That's why she picked us. What do you mean she picked us? We complement each other's demons. None of them are ready for what Masha has in mind. I don't think they're ready. It's perfectly safe. Creator David E. Kelly and company ratchet up the tension. They were just so engaging the scenes and because of because the writing bounces so well between the characters, I mean, it's incredible ensemble writing. You're just not going to be let down by the writing, you know, when you've got David writing characters that are that much fun. And I just remember being like, what? Like saying things out loud while I was reading it or like, this is insane. She picked nine people who needed to be in a place where they would try anything she wanted. Have you all gone?
on, man. <laughs> In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Okay. Audiences paid to see Free Guy, the comedy adventure starring Ryan Reynolds, opened up at the top. The movie scored $28.4 million. The horror thriller sequel, Don't Breathe 2, debuted in second place. It made $10.6 million. Jungle Cruise took the third place spot with $9 million. And Aretha Franklin's biopic, Respect, opened in fourth place to the tune of $8.8 .8 million. Suicide Squad fell from first to fifth. The film earned $7.8 million. That's a 70% drop from its debut weekend. We are buzzing with excitement for what's going to be on SA Live today. It's going to be the bee's knees. Ooh. Something about honey, maybe? Yes. Yes. Or just a, just a sticky situation, because what, what's this? Uh -oh. What is this? This, That's is why the, this is the beekeeper suit because <laughs> Saturday is National Honey Bee Day, and if you're going to deal with them, you need to have to do, have one of these on. Yes. But the honey will definitely keep yes, until yes. Saturday. Yes, it will. And Stephanie Pena Frost from Princess and the Monkey Home Decor joins us, and you're going to tell us how to help the little worker bees out there. But first, like Mike said. Honey can last forever, right? Correct, honey can last forever, but sometimes you'll see that it'll crystallize. A really good tip is never microwave it, and, and if you want to get that uh, crystals, go ahead and put some hot water. Stick it in some hot water and it'll soften it all up. And speaking of water, you make honey syrup? Honey syrup, yes, equal parts honey and water. Bring it to a simmer, it makes a great syrup. You can add different things to it as well. That's all right, and take a look honey. at all this right here. Those honey jars feature a few infused flavors. Nectar de Fleur is here, and we're going to show off their one-of-a-kind honey. With a very special flower that these bees off, off, eat off of. And honey would taste good on ice cream, too. And our favorite mad scientist is here with ice cream, but you don't have ice cream. Well, no, but I have a very important ingredient. Salt. Salt? Salt, Salt in ice cream? For your instant ice cream. Ah, All right. we are making that. And of course, today, 17 school districts went back to school. We need pictures, too. Yes, I need pictures of you in this because this is amazing. But we're also going to tell you where you can get affordable school supplies. There.